Okay, we move on to the last talk of the session. It is uh, by Laura Garcia Alvarez, Quantifying Qubits Magic Resource with Gotham K GKP in Go. Uh, hello, can you hear me well? I want to move this I would like to thank the organizers for pulling this conference through two years and inviting me. And uh, in this uh, half an hour, I will try to convey the information in this paper and mainly make the keywords so that everyone understands what I mean by Qubit Magic Resource, if you're not familiar with it, and the DKP encoding. So, first of all, I would like to thank my colleagues and collaborators, uh, co-authors of the paper, Oliver Hahn, Julia Ferrini, Nina Ulkitz, who work with me in, at Salmers in Sweden, and uh, also Alessandro Ferraro, who at the time was uh, at Belfast, but now has a double affiliation also in uh, University of Milan. So, the outline will be the following. I will try to introduce what is a resource, resource theories in general, and then uh, focus on quantum resource theories and specifically magic. Then I will talk about the magic measure that we define in this paper and give uh, some overview of what one can do with the ideas that we developed here. So resources uh, emerge in uh, many fields as something of value. You can think of uh, thermal non-equilibrium can create uh, work with a current engine, or chemists can think about uh, what elements do you need to create another element. So in general, it, it's a concept that emerges relative to the physical capabilities. But I will introduce a more abstract example, because one can formalize mathematically uh, a theory of resources. So, for example, consider all plane figures, that's your state space. We can uh, develop a resource theory of the compass and straight edge constructions. So if you consider that uh, what you do with a compass and a straight edge is a free operation, is easy, the free states, what you can um, create with that, will be lines, points, and some of the figures, but not all of the state space. For example, you could not create, uh, given a circle, a square with the same area. So that would be a resource. And that's something very valuable, because if you are given that resource, now I have not only the compass and the straight edge, but I also have that figure, I could create the square with the same area of another circle, just like scaling it up. So in that case, that resource is a catalyst. I would use it for scaling up, and then I throw it away. But it's needed to create that square. So resources is not only something physical, but it can be formalized very mathematically. So in quantum, there are many resource theories. And here you need to think about what is hard to create, but important operationally. So, for example, if you focus on quantum information processing, you need to think about all the possible states, what are the states easy to create, what are the operations easy to perform, and what is not. And there are many uh, resource theories. So, in general, the operations that you will consider easy are called free operations, and it's only a possible subset of all the quantum operations. And the accessible states, in those operations, we will call it free, call them free, and uh, everything else will be a resource. And you want to quantify this resource. Uh, there are many resources, but in particular I will focus on uh, magic qubit resource. So it has been already introduced, but think about um, gate-based quantum computing. So your states will be, so, uh, let's think only with pure states, uh, superposition of uh, 
any state of uh, an array of two level systems, for example, where the i will, go, will be 0 or 1, and you have certain amplitudes for this superposition. The operations are now unitary operations that we call quantum gates, and in general, any um, unitary operation in a many qubit uh, system can be done with a universal gate set. And uh, let's pick uh, the one that is there, that is the spin node, is the X, had a mark phase, and the T. And there, I already hint what are the clear for operations will be the easy ones for the resource of magic. And the operation that is going to be hard to perform is the T uh, gate. So the concept starts emerging now already. So let's uh, see what is Clifford. The Clifford loop is the group of transformations that preserves the Pauli group acting by conjugation. So the Pauli group is an intensor product of the Pauli operators, and any uh, transformation that you do that map some operator of the Pauli group to the Pauli group is called Clifford. So for example, going from a sigma x to a minus sigma x is allowed uh, because it belongs to the Pauli group and all that you see there are allowed. But going from the sigma x to the Hadamard wouldn't be allowed. That you could do, but not with a Clifford gate. Why um, is important um, to consider what are the states that are preserved with the Clifford uh, group. They are called stabilizing states, as opposed to manic states. And if you start with a stabilizing state, and you apply the Cliffords, um, any sequence of Cliffords, you will get uh, eventually to uh, construct a stabilizing state. Manic states, on the opposite, cannot be reached with these Clifford operations and enable a non clifford operation or a manic operation via teleportation. I will explain that later. But they are the resource here. And uh, for one qubit, it's uh, more or less easy to visualize. Uh, H and T would be the magic states, and the Pauli eigenstates are the stabilizer states. So the Pauli eigenstates are the ones in the vertex of the tetrahedron, and the magic you see um, should be in the surface because they are pure states. But uh, think about the um, normal projection of those, po those points that you see there. So this tetrahedron is the convex combination of all stabilizer states. And the most magic states are those farthest from these spaces. For a qubit, you can visualize. Why uh, are um, magic states important? Also, uh, computationally, there is the Gottesman new theorem that states that if you have a quantum computer that can only have qubits initialized in a Pauli eigenstate, so that's a stabilizer state, you can only perform key for group operations and can only perform Pauli measurements that can be efficiently simulated with a classical computer. So, money is a resource. You need to introduce either some measurement that is different than Pauli, some gate that is not Clifford, or some other initial state. And uh, let me remind you that the C node, that is an entangling gate, is Clifford. So that hints at um, answering a very fundamental question that is, what is the resource that gives quantum computing the power? It is a very open question. And uh, it's not only entanglement, it's a necessary resource, and it's not only magic, it's all, but it's also necessary, because otherwise you could uh, simulate that uh, classically. So also, from a very practical point of view, magic is important, because in uh, some quantum error correction codes, you can only uh, protect key for operations, so you would like to have input magic states to do universal quantum computation. So that's also very, um, is, is the resource called qubit magic resource. And uh, there are uh, different uh, magic measures in the literature. 
use of the amnesty is a functional over the cyberspace to the real number. So if I have a state, I want to have a function that output a real number and tell me how magic is the, this state. In this uh, case of all program quantum computing, we consider my states as the resource states and the stabilizer states are considered to be free. The stabilizer uh, states, uh, well, uh, the my nestor would be invariant under Clifford unitaries. If I have state, I apply any Clifford, I have another state, the my nestor should give me the same money. It shouldn't increase under computational basis measurement that those students add any magic and uh, it shouldn't increase if I add more systems that are on a stabilized state. So it shouldn't increase under uh, composition with other stabilized states. There are, as I said, many magic measures in the literature. Uh, each of them have their advantages and disadvantages. Some of them are valid for uh, mixed states as well, but uh, these ones a common, um, let's say, drawback of them is that they are difficult to compute because they rely on uh, optimization. You said you have huge Hilbert space. So that's something that uh, the magic measure that we have doesn't rely on, and in that sense, it's easier to compute. Um, now, how we came to this uh, magic measure? There are two kinds of quantum computation, one with discrete variables, Another one with continuous variables. Discrete variables, you have a discrete basis, finite dimensional Hilbert space. Everything that I've uh, talked about until now is discrete basis, is the QH superpositions. But also, you could have uh, quantum systems uh, displayed by continuous variables, where the relevant one observables now will have the continuous spectra, and you deal with uh, infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And instead of the block sphere, you could have phase space representations like the Wigner function and other kind of quasi probabilities. So, the Gottesman, Kitai, Preskin, Cobin uh, is a method to encode a qubit into a harmonic oscillator. So, and the reason for that is to uh, <coughs> make the qubit more resilient to noise, it's a way of error correcting. So if you encode it with certain um, symmetry, certain redundancy, you could improve the lifetime of the qubit in principle. But we won't uh, focus on that. We will we, we use it just as, as a mapping. So you see that the 0 and the 1 uh, by this encoding in the discrete uh, Hilbert space will be now mapped to an infinite uh, sum of delta functions. If used for error correction, you need to normalize these functions. We don't use it because we use it as a mathematical trick. So we don't need to uh, renormalize this. We will just use the, the transformation. And uh, why this uh, encoding? It's because it's very convenient, because field operations are Gaussian operations. Now we can access all the theorems that exist in continuous variables. So if you see the Pauli operations, all of them are um, Gaussian. As you see, it goes up to some quadratic function in the exponent. But the T gate that was magic, it is cubic. So it's non-Gaussian. It's this uh, analogy that allows us to develop our DKT uh, magic measure. So the linear function, as I said before, is a representation in the classical phase space. And um, it's a quasi probability distribution whose marginals give probability distributions. It uh, contains all the information of your state, it's just another representation. And uh, we use this because there is already a resource theory related to Wigner negativity in continuous variables. So, through the encoding, we will borrow those results and create a magic measure. This resource theory of Wigner logarithmic negativity or Wigner negativity classifies these uh, resources in continuous variable systems. So here Gaussian operations are free, Gaussian states are free, and also Gaussian uh, measurements. And uh, as I said, we will use it to transfer 
properties using the GKT encoding. We compute the linear function for a general uh, single qubit state, and the only thing that is relevant here is the this minus 1 to the st, where st is just some uh, integral number, which basically says that any qubit state encoded in GKP, including a stabilizer state, any state, will have uh, one quarter of the summons of this Wigner uh, function negative and three quarters positive. So any state will have some Wigner negativity, also stabilizer states. And uh, we plot that, uh, think that the dark points are negative, the white points are positive, and the rest is zero. And we observe that ah, maybe we cannot use it because everything is negative, including stabilizer states. But then we plot my states, and the difference is that there are more uh, negative points. But uh, this uh, phase space representation, because we haven't normalized, goes through the whole uh, phase space. So we thought, can we um, define some bigger negativity per unit cell? Because you have some translation symmetry. And uh, we compute first for one uh, qubit, reducing the bigger negativity to one unit cell. So there is some inherent negativity in every state, even for stabilized states, and we subtract that. And we saw that for one qubit, it seems to give the correct results. So the most uh, mild states are the ones that have more linear logarithmic negativity, and the stabilizer states, once you, um, once you eliminate this inherent negativity, they give zero linear uh, logarithmic negativity. So that led us to, to think that we could develop a DKP mild measure. We just need to extend it to many qubits. And that's what we did. So instead of having uh, one uh, qubit state, now you have not only one lattice, but many harmonic oscillators, many lattices, and we will try to develop something similar. So in the end, even for an n qubit state, what we have to compute is some big net function that it will be a sum of the gap deltas. And uh, this sum, as I uh, plot there, will give us some function that outputs a real number, hopefully the magic of the discrete variable system. That is what allows us to define uh, this uh, DKP magic. Take the DKP beginner function after the encoding, compute the beginner probability negativity per cell, because otherwise we would have an infinite amount of negativity, Subtract the inherent negativity that also arises for multi lattices, and then we reach this uh, expression. And um, it doesn't have, in principle, if you look at it, any hint that we did all this trick of going to continuous variables and then uh, compute there some big negativity. It, it is related to some. Uh, um, quantities that are given already in this basis. So this, as I said, has no obvious connection to continuous variable, and also is very similar to something called the ST norm. But we realized later, and it was previously not a magic measure, but only a one-way witness. So without knowing, we recover something already defined in these variables, but the less thought, less powerful. And it's easier to compute numerically than other measures, just because you don't have to do this convex optimization that in principle is easy, but the figure space is gigantic. So it becomes unreasonable to perform for more than five qubits. This we could compute for up to 12 qubits in very little time in, in our laptop. It does uh, fulfill all the criteria to be a magic measure, so it uh, fulfills the invariance under the for unitaries, faithfulness, it gives zero when it is stabilizer, and only when it is stabilizer state, invariance under composition, other, of, uh, other stabilizer states, non increasing under computational basis measurements, non increasing under power operations, conditional measurement, and the additivity. You have two, uh, a tensor product of two states that are magic, 
it gives you the, the sum of uh, the money of each of them. So with this, what we can do is to um, calculate bounds. Each my measure may give you a different bound. What you want is to close as much as possible your upper bound, meaning that you have uh, some input of k copies of, of the state side, and you want to know how much money do I need to have n copies of state five. If you have already a protocol that does that, that's your upper bound. You know that you can do it with this magic. But the magic measures will give you a lower bound, meaning that at least with, if you only have Clifford Unitaries, Pauli measurements, stabilizer states, you will need at least this magic. So you want a magic measure that closes as much as possible that gap so that you can think of optimal protocols. Um, yeah, that's uh, exactly what I said uh, now. And um, the problem that we have is that we can only calculate the resource content for states, but if we use teleportation circuits, as I said before, you have some mind state in the beginning, you do some uh, protocol and a measurement, it's as if you would have done the gate. So you could also consider this to measure the money of gates. And uh, you can also consider the, some so Jamerkowski uh, um, identity to also see how to how the mic is in that uh, gate instead of the state, and we have uh, some results. So to conclude, we have defined a magic measure, the EKP magic, based on continuous variables techniques and resources. We recover something from the speed variables and upgraded its status. And uh, its structure allows easier computation just because it doesn't have this optimization part and it can give analytical values. And the idea would be to generalize to qubits, generalize to mixed states, and maybe through these encodings transfer more results from continuous variables to discrete variables. Um, and uh, with that, I finalize. Thank you. Thank you Laura very much for your presentation. We now take questions. Thank you. Very nice talk, thank you. The, um, yes, so do um, you have in mind uh, an implementation for your codes? And the related question is how does that compare with the CAT codes which are used by the uh, with uh, you know microwave photons uh, in Yale, for instance, in Paris? You, you, you know these things? Uh, yes, yes. Um, so here we use the bosonic code, the DKP code, as a mathematical uh, tool. So we use that to create the mathematical expression of the measure just because you can identify with that code Gaussian operations with Clifford operations. And that is crucial for a magic resource theory. With other codes, CAD codes, other rotational symmetric codes, that is no longer true. And maybe they are useful for uh, other transferring of results, but not for this uh, magic uh, resource. Okay, so you are in the theoretical world. Yeah, yeah, we are in the theoretical world. Thank you. So this is really nice work. Uh, uh, and um, do you have an upper bound on how much? You gave this nice lower bound in terms of GK ma magic, uh, GKP magic about you know, how, how many operations it takes to, to do a transformation. Do you have an upper bound? Could the upper bound be infinity, for instance? <laughs> you need to compute it. Uh, well, but no, uh, do, do, do you have a guarantee that if you have GK, this GKP magic that, you can, that with a finite number of operations, you can always say perform universal quantum computation? Ah, uh, well, um, no, I mean, like, there are classical uh, codes that simulate uh, some uh, quantum uh, protocol with magic, and what we know is that those classical codes, the time scales exponentially with the magic. So I guess that if you have a limited amount of magic that is still handled by those codes, 
is the classic is mutable, let's say, but if you increase the magic, if you uh, the system or, or uh, let's say the time scales exponentially, so I don't know where it's the limits, but uh, let's say, yeah. So another question, which is, uh, I, I think the answer to this is probably open, but um, uh, suppose, can you define the uh, log uh, bigger negativity as defined for any continuous variable state, but it's not known that any continuous variable state with log negativity is magic. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's, I think, an open conjecture, actually. And can you combine this? You're using this special GKP construction. Can you look at your measure for any continuous variable state with log negative beginner, uh, 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 log beginner negativity? Yes, yeah, so the beginner function is well defined in continuous variables. Yeah. You can have this resource theory for any continuous variable states. It's called the resource theory of beginner logarithmic negativity. Now, in discrete variable states, uh, the beginner function is only defined for odd prime dimensions. So with multi-qubit systems, there is a problem. To my knowledge, there was one attempt of defining Wigner discrete Wigner function for qubits, but only works for one qubit. Mm -hmm. So I know that in odd prime dimensions, if you have qubits, then there is an equivalence between Wigner negativity, in this case the discrete Wigner function, and non-stabilizedness. But for qubits, I think it's not known. To my knowledge. Okay. Do you have do we have any additional question? Okay, then we can thank Laura.